Chapter 1 The Fork Chariot In the darkness, a shadow was stirring. Tiny hands strapped on a slim belt sheathed a short-bladed dagger into its scabbard and removed a coiled buffalo whip from a hook on the wall. A satchel was retrieved from a corner and slung over one shoulder, a brass eagle-eye lens taken down from a shelf and dropped in, then the shadow edged furtively out of the room. It tiptoed down a spiral staircase to the ground floor, making a brief detour to the kitchen to add some provisions to the satchel, then headed further down into the mud cellar, treading barefoot across its cool stone floor in the pitch darkness. It climbed another short flight of steps and slipped out through the front hatch, careful to slide the heavy door closed with as little noise as possible. A stone path overarched by a tunnel of flowering branches led from a columned portico to the front gate, through which the dark figure squeezed with a soft creak. So far, so good. Outside, the night was silent and still. The shadow padded quickly along a leaf-dappled walkway and out onto a cobbled road, where, under the dim light of moon and star, it assumed the form of a girl. Safe beyond eyeshot from her parents' window, she turned to check the huddle of dwellings from which she had just emerged. The houses nestled comfortably amid the foliage at the end of the tree-lined cul-de-sac, like a clutch of lumpy eggs, each one draped in a mossy blanket of creeper leaves and studded with dark, round windows. Seeing no activity, Mino Ra turned her attention to the heavens. The violet sky was sparsely strewn with bright stars and silver clouds, and the air was crisp and chill. Dawn was not far away. She was on time. She gave a sniff of approval, adjusted satchel strap and buffalo whip so that they traced an X across her chest, then took off, jogging along cobbled streets and down narrow lanes, weaving between dark buildings, hopping over curbs, nipping across open greens and silent squares, until a towering black shape, long and crenellated, loomed ahead of her. The Reich was the buttressed and castellated protection wall made of stone and wood that encircled the township in which she lived, the town of Ga, sole settlement of the land of Ga, and central urban hub for the Ghiari, as its short, rustic, ruddy-skinned inhabitants were known. Activity was just beginning to stir in the streets. A distant voice called out, a wheel rattled, a beast gave a gurgling roar, lusty noises in the pre-dawn still. The four portcullised openings in the Reich would remain lowered and locked until just after sunrise, but there were other ways for an enterprising twelve-year-old to get beyond the confines of the township without the gatekeeper's seeing. Minnow's sprite-like form flitted across an open lawn and pushed through a belt of scrub that abutted the base of the Great Wall until she arrived at a piece of board, lying like a trapdoor in the earth, partly concealed by soil and leaf litter. She got her fingers underneath it, heaved it up, and climbed down into a lightless hole not much bigger than the brim of a paddock hat. A short crawl through total blackness, some damp soil and a few root ends, and the pint-sized escapee popped up on the outside of the township. She thrust her way through another border of thick, thorny bushes, this one running along the outer base of the Reich, took a cautious look around, and set off across a flat, open field, blowing out clouds of steamy breath in the chilly darkness. When the ground began to rise, she found a cart track that cut diagonally athwart a steep, grassy slope and began to climb. At the top of her ascent, which was about two hundred feet, she found herself on the rounded crest of a ridge. It was called Palia de Viari, the hill of four trees, for it was dominated by four huge Lapian trees with mighty boughs and a single vast canopy, and their massive rippling roots splayed into the earth like a waist-high maze. 
Panting, Minnow searched the crest, moving between trunks and low branches, stepping over roots and stones. She found nobody. All the same, she called in a hoarse whisper, Hi! Who's up? Anyone here? No answer. Irritated to discover she was first to arrive, she turned to scan the surrounding terrain. The Valley of Gar lay spread out below her like a dark green bowl. Its floor was flat and oval-shaped like an arena, except for the very middle, where the township itself covered a large, rounded hummock called Stone Hill. The wide, flat ring surrounding the hummock, which Minnow had just scampered across, was called the Green Belt. The circle of peaked ridges that enclosed the valley, the rim of the bowl, up to whose southwestern crest she had just climbed, was called the Crown Ridge. Her position let her gaze directly across at Stone Hill, where ribbons of mist wreathed about its silent buildings, the Hall of Elders and tall white watchtower at the summit, the burning belly tavern and the empty market square halfway up, and high upon the southern side, the block-like Temple of Thram, patron deity of the plainsfolk. Encircling the base of the hill, the castellated Reich Wall was clearly visible in the waning starlight, its four arch-framed portcullises at north, east, south, and west disgorging tree-lined cart tracks that ran to and fro about the valley. But no approaching figure could Minnow see. A cool gust of wind made the little girl shiver. Annoyed, she retreated among the waist-high roots, found a sheltered nook, and lay down on her back to wait. She rubbed her cold arms, muttering as she stared into the black web of branches looming overhead. After a time, she fell silent and closed her eyes, and breathed in the scent of night flowers drifting on the breeze. There's still time to call a halt to this absurd venture she thought. A series of images flashed upon her inner eye. Uniforms, golden breastplates glinting in the sun, rolling chariots, boots marching in unison, a mighty barracks. She had only been five when her father, the formidable charioteer Zempidayu Ra, a respected captain in the royal dragon cavalry of Basin, the great and distant capital, had been presented with the honor parade due him on the day of his retirement. After that cherished day, he had come home to Gar for good, whereupon he'd been made head of the town watch, a kind of sheriff. But Minnow knew it had always been his heart's desire for a son to take after him, to learn the way of the charging Lun dragon, maybe even to rise higher in the ranks than he had done, bringing honor and accomplishment to the humble name of Ra. The family had been at the breakfast table when a statement from Minnow's mother, Briala, had shattered that dream. Briala had recently recovered from a debilitating illness, but, despite being still quite young, the infection, the town healer had explained, had left her unable to bear any more children. And Minnow had watched the interest, plain upon her father's face, turn first to frozen bemusement, then to bitter disappointment as the understanding sank into his mind. Zemra was a decent, considerate man who abhorred the notion that his three devoted daughters, Forzana, Liarella, and Minnow, whose true name was Mantu, might believe he was not satisfied with them, that they were not enough for him. But to Minnow, that dreadful look of false cheer upon his honest face had been even worse than the obvious pain of his dashed hopes. Without thinking, she had blurted, Father, I will learn. Teach me. I will learn the way of the dragon. I'll drive a chariot and follow you and bring glory to the house of Ra. I promise I will. Her eldest sister, the sturdy, sharp-featured Forzana, whose habitual scorn for Minnow actually hid a jealousy of her little sister's unassailable fearlessness, had scoffed, Everybody knows there's no girls allowed in the army, stupid. Minnow glared at the older girl. Well, I don't care, do I? Because I'm not going to do it in the army, am I? I can do whatever I want, and you're not going to stop me, stupid. 
Liarella, the middle eldest, round-faced, spotted and pale, said softly, Anyway, it's the cavalry that doesn't take women. I think the army does, at least the sentinels do. Father's deputy, Sepria, she was in the sentinels, wasn't she, papa? But Sempidayura was pulling his golden beard and gazing at Minnow through weary hazel eyes. Do you really mean this thing? he asked, frowning. Yes, I can do it, papa. Just as good as a boy, any boy, she scowled at Forzana, and specially as good as a girl. Zempidayu put a warm hand upon his youngest daughter's head and said, My little fish, how loyal you are. Very well. When you get a little older, we shall fly in the face of tradition. I shall teach you the way of the fork chariot if you really wish to learn. I do, she had pleaded, her wide-eyed child's promise meaning everything to him in his moment of disappointment. As she lay now among the roots of Pallia Deviari, her lips silently formed the same phrase. I do, father. I do really wish to learn. A loricle chattered loudly close by, waking her from a doze with a start. She blinked, seeing the night was almost lifted. The sounds of Gar coming to life were drifting across the valley, the chinking clatter of the portcullis at South Arch being raised, shouted greetings, the blows of a steel mallet, whistles and good-natured jeers. Minnow heard the thud and swish of approaching footfalls and she rolled onto all fours to peep above the roots. Two silhouettes were approaching along the ridge from the right. They were a large four-legged beast being led on a tether by a hunched, youthful male staring at the ground, his hands thrust deep into his pockets. Both the lad and the beast were blowing out clouds of misty breath as they walked. It was Minnow's friend, Yalarik, one of the sons of a local rancher, and he was bringing her beloved she-dragon, Ruby. Minnow's heart leapt at the sight of her. Yalarik's nasal voice called out, Oi, Bid, you here? I'm here. She stood up, but she was so short this did little to betray her position. Where are you? asked the newcomer. He sounded irritable. Here, she snapped. You're late. That's because it's the crack of bloody dawn, isn't it? Yalarik shot back. I'm not used to getting up before the damned stable keepers, am I, eh? Where are you? I can barely see you. Minnow had to scissor her legs over several tall roots to reach him. I'm not surprised you can't see, she giggled, pointing at the boy's face, which was so muffled up only his eyes peered out. You look stupid. Stupid and warm, he saw her bare feet. No shoes again? Aren't you cold? No, it's summer, she said stubbornly. Doesn't bloody feel like it. Anyway, here's your animal. I kept her in my stall for the night. He frowned. What are you up to, anyway? Why didn't you just bring her from your own stall in town? Because then I would have been forced to wait for the gates and explain what I was doing and all the rest of it, answered Minnow tersely. This way I can get away early without any stupid grown-ups asking questions. But why? Never mind why. Stop asking. You're as bad as they are. I have my reasons. All right, all right. No need to get testy. Anyway, you owe me a buffalo muster. That's what we agreed, isn't it? When can you do it? When I can do it, said Minnow firmly. You tell me when, and if I can, I'll be there. And you'll bring your whip? She opened her arms, as if to say, Look at me. Think I could muster buffalo without one? Fair enough, shrugged the boy. Right time off back to the stud. We think the red's gonna lay our eggs soon. I'll see you later. All right, see you, and thanks. The lad headed off down the crown ridge, arms swinging. Minnow turned her attention to Ruby, whose excitement at seeing her little mistress knew no bounds. She was nodding, frolicking, thumping her blunted talons against the ground. Good morning, my darling Ruby, said the girl on tiptoe to kiss the leathery snout. Look here now. She reached into her satchel and produced a handful of skell, the plump, abundant leaf that had long ago replaced meat as the Lund dragon's favorite staple. While Ruby tucked in noisily, Minnow removed her saddle 
and carried it around to the far side of the crest, where she concealed it among tall roots and covered it with dead leaves. The Lun were a species of powerful flightless dragon bred for riding and the drawing of chariots. They were noble beasts, prized and revered. Thoroughbred dragons were rarely used for such mundane work as pulling plows, wains and other vehicles, for this was generally considered below the Lun, more a job for the lanky, long-necked Quarotum, or the bulbous but incredibly strong Giargut Yak. Few children in Ga were lucky enough to own a pedigree dragon, and Minnow was the envy of many of her contemporaries. Well-bred Lun were extremely expensive, not something the Ra family would ever have been able to afford ordinarily, but several seasons before, Ruby had been gifted to Minnow by Yelarik's father, Holligan, after she had inadvertently foiled the theft of a brace of his most valuable animals by a gang of thieves. A chance observation by the youngest Ra, who'd been playing truant as usual, had alerted her father, the watch commander, to the robbery, after a lazy auctioneer had left the livestock unattended at a local yard prior to a market sale. The grateful rancher, Holligan Stocksire, had allowed Minnow to choose any one of the beasts he would have lost had the crime been successful, and she had run immediately to the pretty and affectionate Ruby. She was a lovely beast, and aptly named. Her smooth, leathery scales were pale pink over the face and neck, running to a rich blood scarlet over the shoulders and back, darkening to deep wine crimson, almost black, over all four of her legs. She had a muscular rump, wide shoulders, and a tail as long as a child's forearm. Her nose was long, with widely flared nostrils that would turn to the earth, her big black liquid eyes twinkled with intelligence and were shallow set, looking both ahead and to the sides at once, while small, forward-pointing horns emerged below swiveling leaf-shaped ears. Her thin purple tongue shot out now and again, this was to perform the slightly distasteful habit of cleaning out her own nostrils, or to draw to her four rows of incisors and molars clumps of delicious scale. The sky had brightened a good deal by the time Minnow mounted up and left the meeting place, riding west along the ridge at a brisk walk, then veering south, heading away from town. Tilting off the ridge line and starting down the outer slope of the crown ridge, she urged the dragon, Yes, yes, come on, go girl, go, accelerating faster, faster still, until their descent became a reckless, whooping career all the way down into the wide, open grain fields that lay at the bottom. She raised her little fist and yelled with delight as Ruby's heavy body hurtled into the ripe hollycorn, sending pale yellow clouds of tiny seed pods exploding into the air. The sun's fiery brow peered over the northern skyline, painting Minnow's back a deep magenta. Slowly the sky filled with layers of light and color, seeming to shape itself into a vast rainbow-colored dome. Lampflies danced over the fields in whirling clouds, loricles and chatterbugs twittered and swooped, glowing starwings shot out of the grass like falling stars that had changed their minds and decided to jump back into the heavens. It was bliss. Look up, Rube, cried Minnow letting her head reel back in wonder. It's like we're moving across the bottom of a lake, and the clouds are like leaves or lilies floating across the surface, way, way above us. Ruby was in ecstasy at this unexpected treat, an early ride, alone with her beloved mistress, ambling through a feathery ocean made crimson by the dawn that rolled all the way to an unbroken horizon. She snorted and shook and whipped her little tail, and it felt as if they had all the world to themselves. After riding for what seemed a long time, a distinctive rounded prominence appeared upon the skyline ahead of them, and when she saw it, Minnow almost ruefully remembered the purpose of her excursion. Arriving at its base, she dismounted, feeling a twinge of apprehension. She left Ruby to consume another handful of skell leaves from her satchel, took out her battered brass eagle eye and strode up the slope. At the crest she fell to her knees and peered over, 
revealing another shadowy spread of plains turning rusty orange under the changing sky. Perched below her in the midst of the open flat was a farmhouse, surrounded by a cluster of outbuildings and several sizable crop spirals, mostly bell cane, sacem maize, and tall green hollycorn. The dwelling, like most houses in Gar, including Minnow's own home, was a balam house. That is to say, it had been constructed from a balam tree. It stood like a misshapen, chocolate-brown egg, half buried in the earth and covered in a blanket of purple-green leaves that shivered in the morning breeze. The building was entered from a small porch, roofed and pillared, that stood separate from the house by about twenty feet, from which a stairwell led down into the earth to an entry cellar, thence up into the dwelling from below. This was to make the act of raiding the home difficult for the bandits and various other unsavory characters that occasionally passed through the lands preying on isolated peasants. The rest of the buildings were scattered haphazardly, like carelessly discarded boxes. Minnow pressed the eagle eye to the bridge of her nose and scanned the ranch, searching for signs of movement. Come on, my dears, she murmured. You've done the same thing forever. Don't let's do something different today. Sure enough, a sturdy, slanted hatch soon slid open in the porch, and three stumpy little figures emerged, trooped across the yard and entered one of the outbuildings, only to reappear moments later, each one armed with a pair of long-bladed shears. Time for the dawn, Snip, said Minnow softly, as the trio trudged off towards one of the crop spirals and vanished into the swathe of green. Holly corn farmers, particularly during the drier seasons, invariably ventured into their fields at sunrise to clip away the pale night shoots that sprouted from the bases of the fattening grain stems, for this encouraged the buds to swell and lengthen, giving a healthier yield. Furthermore, Minnow knew very well that the elderly sister and two brothers in her lens were the only three inhabitants of the ranch. She also knew that in one of the outbuildings, unattended and unused, stood the object of her current mission, and it would be very unlikely, should the item be temporarily removed, that it would be missed, provided it was returned in good time. When the hilltop observer was satisfied the owners had departed to perform their dawn task, she trotted back down to Ruby, mounted up, rode over the rise, and jogged cautiously down to the homestead. The wind rose as she arrived at the main gate, sending a hiss through the grain spirals. Her palms damp with nerves, she dismounted and led her steed into the farm, leaving the gate wide open. She wove quickly between the outbuildings until she found the one she wanted, flung open the rickety door and led Ruby inside. She was in a gloomy, dusty old barn. Beams of crimson light shot through uneven slats and perforations in the walls. On a rusty hook hung a grubby harness, all buckles and rings and slim metal rods. Minnow drew in a momentous breath and paused, triumphant, for there in the far corner, covered by a dirty old tarpaulin, stood a long unused vehicle that looked like a gigantic pale conch shell around the size of a family dinner table. It had four wheels in all, one larger and one smaller on each side, joined by a pivoting X-shaped axle that ran underneath, a suspended flap shooting out at the rear, and two long shafts for hitching to either side of a dragon's body by way of a yoke harness, like the one dangling from the hook. The vehicle was called a fork chariot. Fork chariots were small, versatile, highly maneuverable cavalry chariots, each drawn by a single armored dragon and manned by three warriors apiece. They were so named because they traveled in threes, making a fork formation to be thrust like a trident into the enemy's battle flanks. Three chariots, each bearing three formidable soldiers capable of archery, spearplay, and swordplay, made a fork unit. Minnow's father, Captain Isan Zempidayura, had in his day been the highly respected leader of a number of trident companies in the Imperial Dragon Cavalry of Basin, K-1. 
capital of the Bithynian Empire, on whose remote edge lay the tiny, little-known land of Ga. Minnow thrust back the canvas cover and was enveloped by a cloud of dust. Snorting and waving it away, she got to work, pulling the vehicle out of its corner, organizing the trappings, securing the attachments. It proved to be a more difficult job than she'd reckoned. Some time ago, her father had shown her the procedure for hitching the carriage to the animal, how it was done, the names of all the pieces and parts, and she racked her brains to remember all the details. She pictured her father locking spindle, shaft, and axle, and buckling it to the harness, explaining as he went. The order is very important, little fish, he had insisted in his oaky voice. If done carelessly, the vehicle might shake loose and crash. If done properly, such a thing is impossible. The big court chariots of Basin are borne by four strong dragons apiece, two in front and two in the rear and the beasts are trained to move in perfect harmony. Those vehicles can carry whole platoons of warriors and all their gear besides, but this little vehicle that holds only three people is much simpler. Yes, father, she had said, impressed. Now, what is the name of this that we stand upon? He had asked, pointing to the floor of the carriage. The plate, she replied. Good, he grinned. And this? He indicated the axle that joined the wheels. The bolt. Good. And what is this that protects us while we ride? The shell. Good. You seem to know much already, small one. Actually, her knowledge did not extend very far beyond that point. She took the harness down from its hook, dragged the yoke over Ruby's back and affixed it around her muscular shoulders. Then Minnow did her best to tighten the straps and fix the buckles and couplings in the correct order while the dragon stood patient and still. When she stepped back to inspect her efforts, she could not help feeling it did not altogether resemble her father's taut-looking assembly, but it seemed to hold together well enough, and she figured she could always stop to adjust things along the way. The important thing was to get out of there as quickly as possible in case one of the farmers returned. She used a stone to chalk open the barn door, spent a long moment peering out to check the coast was clear, then went to touch noses with Ruby. We can do this, she whispered, as much to herself as to the dragon. Don't be scared. Come on, it's time. She patted the leathery neck and gently led the beast outside. The chariot, rusty with disuse, creaked into motion, its wheels protesting. Ruby had been harness-trained, but it had been a long time since she'd pulled a vehicle, and it was important to keep her calm lest she panic at this strange new contraption trailing relentlessly behind her. Minnow shut up the barn, made a final walk-around check, then climbed into the shell, wiping sweaty palms on her sides. When all was ready, she closed her eyes, clasped her hands, and tilted back her head. Dear Lord Thram, she addressed the sky. I'm pretty sure you're angry with me right about now, but all I ask is that you understand I'm doing this for my papa. Maybe that means it's not so bad, she added hopefully. Plus, it's not stealing if we put it back. Is it? The thing is, if you can just see your way clear to helping me do this one thing, then I promise I'll spend the rest of my life doing lots of good things to make up for it. Anyway... That's all of it. Thanks. She opened her eyes and took up the rain rod. All right, Rube, here goes. She took a final deep, bracing breath, then dealt the she-dragon a smart tap on the rump, and the vehicle jolted forward, crunching loudly across the sparse but kept yard. The errant charioteer, looking decidedly comical with only her round head peeping above the shell, Bounced from side to side, searching fervently for wobbly wheels, loose fittings or weak points in the harness, but she was very relieved to note there appeared to be none. Leaping down to shut the open gate, she made a silent promise to return the farmer's property without them or anyone else ever being aware it had been borrowed. As Ruby labored up the slope they had descended earlier, Minnow looked repeatedly over her shoulder, wincing for during these few moments they were in full view of the fields below.
Luckily, or unluckily, depending on one's retrospective point of view, no shout came. Passing over the crest of the prominence, Minnow saw all traces of night had vanished from the heavens. Orthil, the north sun, had arisen from his shadowy bed and was cloaked in rippling banks of scarlet-yellow fire, a finger's width above the dark horizon. Before her, a pale golden patchwork of fields and plains spread far and wide, its creases and valleys grey-green with mist. Rolling down the incline, they accelerated rapidly, and Minnow gave a squeal of alarm, for the carriage seemed to rock unsteadily, but Ruby, remembering her training, took it in her stride and gathered speed to compensate. The driver had to make a sudden, panicked grab for the shell as they lurched forward, but she found her balance as they evened out on the flat. We're doing it, Rube, she yelled, hair flying. It's working! The dragon replied with a bellow of delight, shook her head and began to run, long, even strides, her paws thumping over the turf. And Minnow found herself whizzing at a fine pace, heading due east towards the Pyrium Sea.